Hey everyone, welcome to today's Green Living Seminar presentation. I'm Elena Traster, a professor in the um, Environmental Studies Department here at the Massachusetts College of Liberal Arts. This semester's Green Living Seminar is organized around the theme, Capitalism and the Environment. All of these presentations are free and open to the public. They take place on Wednesdays at 5.30 in room 121 of MCLA's Center for Science and Innovation. You can find the schedule and links to recordings of prior presentations at www.mcla.edu slash greenliving. Our presentation today will go for about 45 minutes or so, followed by a question and answer session at the end, so do remember your questions. And a brief plug for next week's presentation, we hope you'll come back next week, Wednesday, February 22nd. Dr. Bogdan Prokopovich from UMass's, UMass Amherst's Eisenberg School of Management will present a lecture titled Stakeholder Management and Corporate Sustainability, CSR Initiatives, Sustainability Certification, and ESG Ratings. Today's presentation, titled GDP is Gross, Well-Being is Better, will be presented by Eric Miller, Director of the Ecological Footprint Initiative at York University, zooming in from Ontario, Canada. Thanks so much for being with us today. You're very welcome. Thanks for inviting me. So it's a pleasure to speak to you today about GDP is gross, well-being is better. Um, when I heard about your seminar, Green Living, um, the first thing that came to mind was sort of high-level questions that I think is really important when we're thinking about the green and the living part of uh, green living. And so I'll start off uh, that way. Um, so I'll start off by raising the important question of what should we aim to grow or shrink or sustain? I think this is a very important and profound question. And it's a question that is very important in economics, but also very important at large when we're thinking about a society and priorities uh, and the future and so on. And related to this, then how can we measure this? How can we measure the things that we might want to grow or shrink or sustain? And also what affects these measures? And so it's really important to keep these uh, in mind because the more that we can answer these questions, the more that we can uh, guide ourselves to a purposeful and, uh, you know, and, and purposeful future. Um, so um, I'll start off with this first question, what should we aim to grow or shrink or sustain? Now in the context of green living, uh, here's a proposition that I'll, I'll offer at this point. So one is, ideally we'd like to grow human well-being. And at the same time, ideally, we'd like to shrink the human metabolism of ecosystems. And ideally, we'd like to do this while sustaining the Earth's carrying capacity. Now, if you have a background in the natural sciences, you'll have some ideas about what carrying capacity is and maybe some ideas of how to measure that and perhaps what affects those measures. Um, but I'm only going to focus on the human well-being uh, first, and then afterwards uh, speak to the human metabolism of uh, ecosystems. Now, this is what we should you know, aim to grow and, and shrink and sustain. On the question of how should we measure this, this is one way in which we can measure those attributes I just spoke of. So we can actually measure self-reported life satisfaction. And that's not the only way of uh, measuring uh, life satisfaction. You can also do it by other measures. But I think it's important to reflect on what we've come to learn from measuring life satisfaction by asking people how satisfied they are with their life. And then we can uh, measure the ecological footprint of our metabolism of ecosystems as something that we'd like to shrink. And we can also measure our carrying capacity in the form of biocapacity. My specialization is in measuring ecological footprint and biocapacity, but I'm going to start off by talking about self-reported life satisfaction as a way to begin the living part of this Green Living Seminar. So uh, here's a question I'm going to ask you, a context to uh, imagine being asked, and I'd like you to think of, um, of what your answer to this will be. So imagine a ladder with steps numbered from zero at the bottom to 10 at the top. The top of the ladder represents the best possible life for you, and the bottom of the ladder represents the worst possible life for you. Question, on which step of the ladder would you say you personally feel you stand at this time? So think about that, what that number would be for you. And then the next 
question is, on what step of the ladder would you feel that an average American stands at this time? Maybe you were thinking that you were below the average of your fellow Americans, or maybe you were thinking you were above the average of your fellow Americans. Well, this question has been asked many times among many Americans and among humans all across the planet. And there's a really exciting research initiative focused on happiness and well-being and life satisfaction that brings together the best minds across the globe to analyze this data and to put it together in some really awesome uh, research, um, which I can provide the, uh, the link to at the end of this uh, presentation. I want to share with you some results of what they found from asking this question amongst uh, Americans. This is the answer of the average American. So answer, everyone who answered this question divided by uh, sort of on average amongst all those who answer the question on the question, uh, um, that there was an average score of about 6.977 to that question in 2021. And that represents um, a ranking that is uh, 15th in the world. So there's a lot more countries that have a higher average life satisfaction, but there's also a lot more countries that have a much lower life satisfaction score. Now, what's interesting about this is the same question has been asked over the years. And so there's data about trends and how it's been affected by, for example, the terrible and traumatic experience that all of us have felt during the pandemic and the lockdowns at the start of that. Um, and also among other periods, including the 2008 financial crisis, which significantly affected Americans and others uh, around the world, uh, and so on. Now, it turns out in the last 10 years, the average answer to this question has hovered around this answer. It's fallen slightly, but it's hovered around just clearing seven. It was much higher before the uh, global financial crisis uh, started uh, at the end of 2007 and hit uh, America quite, quite hard. What's really interesting about analyzing this data is that researchers have been able to ask the question of what are some other attributes that exist within the country that can be related to explaining the average answer to this question and changes in the answers to this question uh, over time. And so I'll profile um, some of what this research has, has had to say. So on the question of what explains this average answer what are the components of people's lives that seem to relate to their experienced life satisfaction? It's quite interesting. It turns out about half of the significance that affects the answer to this question relates to a few key attributes that someone can experience or not. One attribute, which is very important, is social support. The extent to which someone has a friend or a relative or someone who they can talk to, who they can count on, who they can support, and who they can feel supported from. It also depends heavily upon healthy life expectancy, the freedom to make life choices, and generosity and the perception of generosity, the sense of trust in others, and the appreciation that people will do good things for others uh, beyond any sense of uh, compensation. That's what we mean by generosity. Now, what are some other attributes that explain uh, the average answer to the question of life satisfaction. Well, it turns out that there is one component that relates worldwide to the average of gross domestic product per capita in each country. And then rounding out the explanation to this uh, question are some other factors. Now, when you hear pundits talk about economic matters, chances are very high that you'll hear them talk about GDP or gross domestic product, but chances are that you might not necessarily hear them talk very much about the importance of social support, healthy life expectancy, generosity, trust in others, trust in institutions, uh, and so on. But I think that's a problem because all of this is really important for us as economists to focus on, to measure, to explain, and to strategize about how to improve upon all of this. Because if there's one thing that I'm sure we can all agree on, it's that surely we should be interested in growing the average answer to this question of life satisfaction. Surely we want it to be much higher than just clearing seven. Wouldn't we want it to be much more on average up to the eights and the nine levels? 
I think we could agree on that. Now, of course, the question is, what's the recipe of success for that? Now, the recipe is going to vary depending upon the individual and, and the group and the family and so on. And, and um, But at the same time, we can, through the research that's been done in this area, understand the extent, as I said, to which these various components um, have an effect on the average uh, answer to these things. Now, when it comes to gross domestic product per capita, that explains about 22% or so of the answer to this question in America, and about a similar level to the answer to the same question in Canada and to other rich countries uh, in the world. Now, what's wild is that America has a very high level of gross domestic product per capita, very high, and it's grown quite a bit uh, over time. And so this is the next thing I'd like to explain uh, a bit more, because I think it's important to um, realize what it captures and what it doesn't capture and the extent to which it's rather limited in explaining our sense of life satisfaction and rather limited to guiding us towards the future about how to improve upon our life satisfaction. So GDP is gross domestic product. You've probably heard about this. It's talked about quite a lot amongst uh, pundits that talk about uh, economic matters. And so what gross domestic product is, is it's a measure within a period of time of how much production took place for which someone was paid for the production and for which that was produced in the country that's being measured. So in this case, the United States of America. And it's the aggregate of all that within that time period. Now, there's a couple of key points to note uh, within all of this. Um, so one is that very often the statistic is predicted or, or is, uh, is um, indicated on a per capita basis, uh, which is where you take the total of GDP and you divide it by the population. So in the case of the United States, the GDP of about $23 trillion uh, in uh, 2022, more or less, if you divide that by the population in America, you can end up with a per capita value of GDP. In the background here, I've plotted uh, gross domestic product in constant dollars over time, in constant 2015 dollars over time, meaning that the uh, value of GDP in all those time periods was adjusted relative to the purchasing power of what existed in the year 2015. So this way we can see the evolution of GDP over time and appreciate in this case, it's tremendous growth over this time period from 1960 uh, to the present, uh, ending in the year 2021 for these statistics. GDP per capita has grown from around $20,000 on a per person basis in 1960, uh, all the way up to over $60,000 per, per person uh, in the United States. Now that's been a tremendous growth in GDP but over this time period, when there are surveyed questions, uh, such as is done um, in the United States through the General Social Survey, and we're asking people the extent to which uh, they're happy or not, or sad or angry and so on. When you look at this sort of data and you juxtapose it along this um, evolution of GDP, you'll find that there's been a decoupling of relationships such that over the last several decades, the dramatic increase in gross domestic product has not translated into improvements upon other metrics that we'd like to see improvements on, including life satisfaction. So this has challenged a lot of people to figure out why this isn't happening and what can be done about it. So um, there's a couple of important points to note in the definition of gross domestic product that I mentioned before. One is that it just sums up the value of everything that was produced in the country within a certain time period. Now, it's probably apparent to you that not all the stuff that's produced is necessarily equally valuable and useful to us, number one. Uh, number two, there's probably a good amount of production that's taking place that's not actually exchanged in monetary terms with others. Another point to note, too, is that the measure of this of how much was paid for that production might not be a good indication of its value, whether positive or negative, or the consequences of all that production when it affected others in the community and others worldwide, let's say. 
And so when we think about all those sort of at attributes, we should be very cautious about um, asserting too much significance in the change in gross domestic product. Because after all, GDP is gross, not just sort of figuratively, but also literally. Now the gross in GDP means that it's gross of the depreciation of um, built assets and so on. So if there's an increase in gross domestic product, it doesn't necessarily reveal whether there's actually more production take, taking place in excess of uh, the wearing down of things that are productive, such as buildings, uh, infrastructure, um, and, you know, and so on. That's what the growth stands for. The domestic, again, related to the country in which it's measured, and the product uh, just measured uh, the uh, production that takes place uh, in the market economy using monetary prices. Now, a key thing to note about this is that when you measure the growth in GDP, it's not necessarily equal to economic growth, even though a lot of people will use the phrase economic growth to describe a growth in GDP. And the reason why it's not necessarily economic is because it's possible to have GDP growth that might in fact be uneconomic. After all, if we're gonna use economic as an adjective, surely we should use it not only you know, as an adjective of economic, but possibly also even uneconomic. So it raises the question of how do we know if something's economic or uneconomic? And that relates to the fundamental point that all market value is not equal to economic value. And so this is an, uh, an important distinction, may or may not be very clear the first time hearing this, but it's important to keep this uh, in mind and I'll help to elaborate on this a little bit. So when we think about the economic value of something, the economic value of something is a measure of its importance to us. Now, the thing is, that things that are important to us may or may not have a market value. In other words, things that are important to us may or may not be exchanged for money in the market economy. And so in that sense, really, when we're thinking about economic value, we should be attentive to uh, economic value possibly being expressed through market value of some form, or possibly also relating to non-market value as well. Now, in the range, realm of market value, this reflects the amount that's actually paid for producing that stuff. And so of course, with all that production that takes place, that means there are that many transactions in the marketplace for that. Now, if we take the total amount of all those transactions divided by the number of people you end up with GDP per capita, but of course it's not revealing the extent to which the distribution might not have been fairly egalitarian. It might be that uh, a lot of the income earned from all that production is earned from people, uh, you know, a concentrated amount of people and not being well uh, distributed across uh, the society, across uh, the marketplace. But the other thing that's important to keep in mind is that for each economic transaction or each market transaction, um, it might not fully capture some non-market values. And that's really important to think about. So when we're talking about GDP, we're talking about a market value but there's potentially other non-market values that are being affected or generated as a consequence of all that production that takes place in the form of GDP. Non-market values can be positive or negative, and there's various ways to categorize these things, but to keep it kind of surplus is simple. In the realm of non-market values that can be experienced, there can be surplus value, benefits that are in excess of what is actually paid for something, and that is especially important when it comes to the public provision of services and the nonprofit provision of uh, services as well. And the realm of non-market value, there are also these things called ecosystem services that you might have already been introduced to in your other classes and so on. And so ecosystem services are benefits that flow to us from nature. They flow freely to us. There's not a payment for them because nature provides them on an ongoing flow basis. Now, the challenge is, if we, when we ramp up GDP, it's possible that we're depleting the capacity to provide ecosystem services. So we want to be attentive to the potential that ecosystem services can be degraded over time if we don't deliberately do something to them uh, for them uh, in order to sustain the non-market value potential from them. Now, there's a lot of potential non-market value as well. There's, of course, pollution and depletion. A lot of pollution and depletion is not fully captured in market prices because in many respects, it can be free or very cheap to pollute, uh, freer or cheaper than the actual consequence of that pollution onto others. 
And the same thing too for pain and deprivation uh, and so on. And when we keep this all in mind, then we should realize that we need to be doing things deliberately to try to make the market value of transactions in the economy more reflective of its consequences on non-market value. Otherwise, the market value will differ a lot from economic value. So that's important to keep in mind. Uh, and all of this calls into question why it is that so much emphasis is given to GDP as a measure of uh, significance and importance, such that if GDP is growing, it's uh, deemed to be something worthwhile and something we should celebrate, or if it's falling, it's necessarily problematic and necessarily something that we should fear. Now, it's possible for these non-market values to actually figure out the importance of them to us as humans, even in dollar terms for an equivalence between the equivalent amount of market value that might give us the same amount of, uh, you know, of, 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 of goodness, of, of value. So it's possible to do this, but if we don't do this, we should just make sure that, again, um, we're keeping this in mind to not get carried away with um, what we're assuming all that GDP to be reflective of. Uh, now, there's various ways to, um, to uh, improve upon all of this. Um, there's ways to improve upon GDP data to make it a better uh, reflection of measures of importance of us to us and of uh, all of our participation in that. And so there's an example here I can profile, which is the Maryland Genuine Progress Indicator. That's one example of an intent to take information that's captured by GDP, but then modify it uh, to provide an indicator that's uh, a better reflection of, of the value uh, to us as humans. And so the Department of Natural Resources actually has had an initiative where they generate the Maryland GPI on a per capita basis. Now this is useful information because what the GPI does is it starts off with GDP and then it adds into the calculation the beneficial, let's say, production that takes place outside the market economy, but is still valuable to us. Um, production that takes place on a voluntary basis, production that takes place on a household basis, the provision of care that's not um, compensated monetarily and so on. So it adds that in and then also subtracts from GDP some of the elements of GDP that it considers as regrettables, things that we'd rather not have had taking place in the form of production. And so that's one way to make this measure more reflective of, um, of, of importance uh, to us um, as humans. And so there's other initiatives around the world and some other uh, initiatives like this on a GPI across America that you should uh, take an interest in and support, and perhaps you can play a role in generating these statistics to uh, provide us with much more meaningful uh, information about trends and so on. Now, another option is to use a better and broader dashboard of indicators. This is another, um, another solution that has been explored around the world. I just profiled the United Kingdom and its uh, Office for National Statistics. It generates um, all kinds of uh, measures related to uh, well-being, and it provides them on a sort of a dashboard basis, um, such that there's a whole bunch of measures that all speak to different attributes of well-being, different attributes of value to us, without necessarily trying to distill them all down into one measure, such as GDD, GDP, or GPI in the case of that Maryland uh, in instance. So this is another uh, approach that uh, that can be done again, providing us with much more uh, useful information. And the components of this information is really important to us, of course, from the perspective of life satisfaction. Again, because so many of those other components beyond GDP are actually explaining the majority of um, the answers to the question of life satisfaction. Uh, so yeah, so. Um, Within all that, it's important to note though that distribution matters and distribution can be measured. And this is really important to keep in mind because even for example, as I said before, the measure of GDP per capita is just taking the total GDP divided by the total population, but it's not reflecting on how many people were involved in producing that or how many people were involved in uh, obtaining the income for all that production. 
so there's various ways that we can measure distribution and we can measure the distribution of all sorts of things. It turns out that there's a lot more information about the distribution of income than there is about the distribution of wealth or the distribution of a lot of other important um, aspects of, uh, you, you know, of, of, of value uh, to us and so on. And that's because there's a lot more information about income because of course, income is a lot of information uh, derived from uh, income tax statistics. Um, income tax is filled out by a massive proportion of the of the, of the population in America and uh, around the world in other uh, rich countries uh, like America. And uh, so that's why when you're looking for the distribution of stuff, you end up finding a lot of information about the distribution of income, even though you probably would want to find distribution about, let's say, wealth, about opportunities, the distribution of things like green spaces and neighborhoods, all sorts of things. Uh, but it's only more recently with the advent of more powerful computing um, technologies and so on that a lot of organizations are providing their data in ways that can be disaggregated. So in other words, looking at the results on a much more fine-tuned basis on the basis of segments of the population or neighborhoods uh, and so on. Anyways, all this though to say again, distribution matters when you're thinking about these other measures of importance. Uh, here's a, an example then of the um, Gini index of household income in the United States. And so this is something you can get from the United States Census Bureau going back uh, to the uh, 1960s uh, to the president. So the Gini index is one way of measuring the distribution of things. And what that does is it looks at um, uh, the distribution in this case of income. If you arrange uh, income recipients from the lowest to the highest, and you plot that graph of the distribution of that, you can measure the extent to which the distribution varies from uh, distribution that would have everyone getting the same amount. If everyone got the, had the same amount of whatever the thing is that you're measuring using the Gini index, you'd have a Gini index value of zero. If there was an extreme amount of inequity, such that one person had all the stuff that is being measured and all the rest of, um, of the group had none, then you'd have a value of one. And so this Gini index can be used to measure uh, the evolution of distribution over time. Now, this is a plot of the Gini index of household income in the United States, uh, which unfortunately has grown uh, over time. Even though the uh, GDP per capita has grown tremendously, um, so has the dispersion in the distribution of income. And so there's a smaller component of society that's gaining a larger share of a growing amount of income. So not surprising then the consequence is quite a variation in the distribution of income uh, coming out of this. Now, there's a few things that are uh, worrying from the living part of the green living uh, expression. And that is that we as humans, we're attentive to the distribution of things. Um, and so um, on things like life satisfaction, the extent to which we perceive there to be fairness in the distribution of things, and that relates to generally speaking, a higher sense of justice and a higher sense of um, of satisfaction for the self, for the household, uh, and for others in society. Now, the other thing too um, with all this is that the distribution of things like income can also affect other things in the green realm and also in the health realm, for example. Here's some data. This is Canadian data, but I imagine it'd be quite similar uh, in America as well. This is age standardized mortality rates for various ailments like HIV, AIDS, diabetes, COPD, and suicide looking at the mortality rates for each of these, with the mortality rates being much higher for those at the lower end of the income distribution. So the extent to which the income distribution is becoming more skewed can also mean that the um, consequences of these ailments can become even worse, even with higher mortality rates related to the distribution of that. And one other thing too, in the realm of inequality that's of, of interest and, and sort of possibly a concern as well, is the extent to which inequalities can be um, transmitted over time through generations. And so there's been some really interesting work looking at the intergenerational earnings elasticity, the extent to which your income is a function of your parents' income or uh, not. Uh, if your income is highly dependent upon your parents' income, which means a higher intergenerational earnings elasticity, uh, it means that uh, your prospects are more inherited than 
based on your own will and ingenuity and, and, and effort and all that sort of stuff. In the United States, about half of uh, the average person's income can be explained by the income of their parent. Uh, whereas in other countries, it's less than that. And there are some other countries where it's even greater than that. But what's interesting, there seems to be a positive relationship between the earnings elasticity through generations and the current in uh, equality of, uh, of income as measured by the Gini coefficient. So all of this has us being somewhat uh, concerned that the distribution in one time period can persist over time, um, which is another challenging thing to, uh, you know, to, to address, um, because of course that comes back to affecting a well-being and life satisfaction. So going back to this um, thought about what should we aim to grow or shrink or sustain, and how can we measure this and what affects these measures, I'll next turn to round this out by focusing on ecological footprint and biocapacity as the sort of green part to the green living aspect of this seminar. So when we think about uh, the green part, I think it's important to think about necessary conditions for living within carrying capacity. And so when we think of us and all our stuff and all the stuff that we consume, uh, it's important to keep it within uh, an obvious context of the lands and waters around us and beneath us that provide us with flows of ecosystem goods and services that allow us to um, consume the stuff that we consume and to exist in the way that we exist. Of course, um, all the stuff that we produce uh, in the market economy uh, is produced by drawing resource inputs from the environment. And the consequence of all that production generates waste outputs. Now, from a sustainability perspective, if we use resource inputs at rates that can be regenerated, then that's one way that we can sustain the flow of those resource inputs. In the same way, when it comes to emitting waste outputs, if we emit those at rates that can be metabolized by nature, then we can sustain a certain flow of waste outputs. And when it comes to uh, settling up our settlements and infrastructure and so on across landscapes, we really want to optimize how we do that, considering trade-offs and pressures upon uh, biodiversity. And so with this sort of relationship, we can appreciate that uh, all the stuff that we produce in the market economy is actually transformed from nature. And all the consequences of that production generates um, waste outputs into the environment. And so we have to bring this broader perspective into account when we're thinking about all that production that, that, that we do. So one of the ways to put all this stuff together is through the concept of ecological footprint and biocapacity, and that's what it aims to do. So an ecological footprint is the area that's needed to sustain our uh, production and consumption of food um, for us and also the food for our pets and for the other animals that, uh, that we eat. Uh, also, the area you need to sustain the provision of fibers for us and our clothing and so on. The area you need to sustain us with uh, timber and other products from uh, forests. The area that's needed to sustain our buildings and our settlements. And the area that's needed to soak up the emissions that we emit through burning fossil fuels. And so that's what an ecological footprint uh, is. And so we at York University, we uh, measure an ecological footprint in the form of various categories from fishing grounds, built up land, cropland, grazing land, forest products, and forest carbon uptake as a way to specify the extent to which our consumption of renewable resources, settlements, and carbon emissions relate to areas of land at home and abroad on this planet Earth. And this concept can be compared to biocapacity, which is the area that's available to sustain an ecological footprint. And so biocapacity can be specified in similar terms of the amount of capacity of forests, for example, to either provide us with forest products or to soak up carbon dioxide uh, emissions from us as humans through burning fossil fuels. What we can do as well is we can specify ecological footprint and biocapacity in the same units of measure as a global hectare. So we can take the hectares uh, of ecological footprint in all the countries around the world and convert them into a common unit of a global hectare by adjusting the ecological footprint in each country based on how much um, capacity there is in that country to yield forest products as compared to the global average. And with this consistent unit, we can make comparisons between footprint and biocapacity 
over time and anywhere across this planet. And that's one of the things that we do at our initiative at York University uh, in Toronto. And so here's a plot of uh, results that we've generated from 1961 to 2018 for the ecological footprint of all of humanity's consumption divided by the biocapacity in that year. And so for many years, uh, from 1970 onwards, this ratio has been above one. The ecological footprint has been in excess of biocapacity. And that's because we've been in this realm of global overshoot where the ecological footprint is in excess of biocapacity. That challenges us to figure out ways to reduce our ecological footprint so that we can um, sustain our consumption of food and fibers and forest products and uh, sustain our buildings uh, uh, occupying lands and so on and sustain uh, our emissions of, uh, of carbon dioxide uh, to the level that can be sustained by uh, the planet. Now, obviously we're in excess and that relates to, of course, accumulation in large part to the um, greenhouse gas emissions in our environment. It also relates to the um, extent that we've been depleting fisheries. We've been uh, in many cases, in many places of the world, uh, overrunning the soil's capacity to regenerate in the provision of food uh, and so on. And so this presents uh, to us a significant uh, challenge uh, into the future, but also provides us with very valuable information that's not apparent otherwise from the usual economic statistics. And so looking at this uh, into the future, if we think out to the year 2050, 2050 is a year when the world has set itself up for a very ambitious target of achieving net zero emissions. Now to go from where we are today to the um, potential for net zero emissions by 2050 means that in 2050, all the greenhouse gas emissions that we as humans would emit by burning however many fossil fuels we'd be burning in 2050 would be fully within the realm of the planet to soak up in that time period. Now, obviously right now we're not there, but this is the sort of the challenge for us in the future is to get our ecological footprint down to shrink it to within the realm of biocapacity uh, by that time period. Now you can see along the timeline, there have been periods when the ecological footprint globally has reduced and those have coincided with significant um, reductions in GDP historically through significant global recessions, such as the global financial crisis, such as the US savings and loans crisis, which also affected other countries in the world, such as the oil crisis back in the 70s uh, and so on. Now, thinking about all of this, it's no doubt challenging, but the good thing with having this information is that we can use this information to answer that important question of what affects these measures? What things can we do to reduce our ecological footprint? And by how much would the ecological footprint be reduced if we do those? And so that's where it's really exciting. We work in partnership with the Global Footprint Network that have devised all kinds of, um, um, all kinds of sort of solutions and have also identified how much each of those would contribute to the reduction in ecological footprint to within the realm of biocapacity. If you're interested, here's a snapshot in 2018 of the ecological footprint of production of all activities that took place uh, in America in that year. And that's compared to the capacity of lands and waters within just the United States uh, to provide that over time. Now, obviously the footprint of production is in excess of domestic biocapacity and that relates to global overshoot and also relates interestingly enough to the extent that imports into America tend to have more footprint embodied in them than exports from America, which means then that the ecological footprint of consumption is slightly more than the ecological footprint of uh, domestic production. And we have data for this of this for all countries uh, across the planet. And this is really helpful to us, helping us understand and helping uh, us uh, help countries understand um, the extent to which their trade relationships relate to uh, ecological footprint, the extent to which trade relationships relate to the use of biocapacity for domestic use or for the use of others uh, across the planet, and also can help us understand the potential for improving upon ecological footprint or reducing that uh, in all countries uh, over time related to the different components and different possibilities there are uh, in all countries. We partner with the Global Footprint Network, as I mentioned just before, uh, and they've got awesome, um, awesome metrics where 
they've devised a uh, hundred um, possible solutions of ways to reduce ecological footprint uh, to get us to that realm of being within the Earth's carrying capacity in the form of biocapacity. And there's uh, for each one of these solutions, they've uh, figured out how many, like the extent of how much of that overshoot can be uh, reduced based on these solutions. So very powerful, again, returning to those important three questions at the outset of thinking about what should we aim to grow or shrink or sustain when we're talking about green living? How can we measure this? And what affects these measures? And so by having answers to those questions, it provides us with a full set of very powerful information to help us you know, inform our pathways uh, into the future. Um, so with all of this, I'll just wrap this up by uh, reflecting that when we're talking about uh, green living, uh, I think I should hope that uh, green living has something to do with sustainability and that has something to do with the stewardship of human built and natural assets. And when we're talking about green living, we should also be thinking about uh, efficiency, the extent to which we can get the most from using the least, very important uh, economically. And we should also be thinking about distribution, especially on the living part of green living. When we're talking about distribution, we're talking about the means, the chances, and the outcomes. And so when we think about all these together, we think about sustainability, efficiency, and distribution, it's important to reflect that we could possibly have sustainable outcomes that may or may not be efficient or may or may not be distributively just. And so it's important to think about um, analyzing possibilities in the future according to how they score with regards to sustainability, efficiency, and distribution. Because success in one doesn't necessarily mean we necessarily have successes in other realms, uh, but by at least being uh, mindful of these and by measuring them, using important measures and figuring out how we can affect those measures, then we can, uh, I believe, uh, aim for the best of green living on this planet that we share with so many others. Uh, over time. And so that's what I wanted to uh, share uh, in this realm. And I'll just say that um, there's various brands of economics that are available. Uh, and perhaps you've done some economic courses yourself. Perhaps you've taken an economics course that is, you know, the economics of such and such. You might have even had like a microeconomics course, a macroeconomics course, uh, et cetera. There's various ways to categorize economics based on the scope of what they focus on. And the other way of categorizing economics is also the approach uh, that they take to um, addressing economic questions and the various tools and techniques they use to answer economic questions. And I'm part of um, I'm 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 part of I guess a broader family who call themselves ecological economists. We do ecological economics, and ecological economics is uh, is interested in those aspects of sustainability, efficiency and just distribution. And so when we're thinking about what should we aim to grow or shrink or sustain, and how can we measure this, and then what affects these measures, we're thinking about measures in those three dimensions of sustainability, equity, and uh, distribution. So I invite you to check out Ecological Economics. Uh, it aims to be interdisciplinary. It aims to be accessible. There's a very vibrant United States Society of Ecological Economics, or UC is the acronym, uh, that you can check out. There's also the equivalent society in other countries, such as in my own country of Canada, the Canadian Society for uh, Ecological Economics. And uh, among the ecological economists um, that are doing really important work, uh, the work that really excites me in this realm of ecological footprint and biocapacity uh, helps others to, um, to sort of round out their thinking about how to guide society towards a just transition towards an economy that is more rewarding for so many more uh, people uh, and also within the realm of carrying capacity. And I'll just finish off with this, which is that um, a colleague of mine, Professor Peter Victor at York University, has written a book called Managing Without Growth. And there's two editions of this. Uh, there was a new second edition uh, issued um, just a year ago. And this is all about managing without GDP growth about looking at how to um, design an economy that is less oriented toward GDP growth and more oriented towards growing those things that we want more of, like life satisfaction and human well-being, and 
shrinking those things that we want less of, like ecological footprint, like our metabolism of the ecosystems and our emission of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And very importantly, uh, his work profiles these sort of computer models that he's built that helps us to understand what affects those various measures. And when we put them all together in a simulation model to understand how to achieve success in all of those realms. So that's my presentation. I hope this um, made sense. I hope it's uh, accessible. I hope it gets you excited about ecological economics. I hope it gives you some other thoughts about uh, green living and uh, how I interpret green living as an ecological economist. And so I'm really keen now to uh, hear your questions or comments you might have uh, on this presentation. Thanks so much. Um, and so I do invite questions. Uh, we've got one already, go ahead. Yeah, great. So the uh, question is, uh, what the status in, in uh, Ontario or in, in Canada as a whole? Uh, is there any um, movement towards incorporating more of these um, ecological economic um, approaches um, to in policy? Is, is there much movement in Canada to incorporating more ecological economic approaches into policy? Well, um, there is some. Um, I think there's just a there's a potential for so much more. And so that's why uh, we in the community of ecological economics are very engaged in doing policy work. Um, if I could just speak to a little bit of ecological footprint and biocapacity, um, there's a couple of really cool things that we're doing now. So one is that we have this data at the national level, uh, but in the province of Ontario, the equivalent of a state um, in, in Ontario where I live, um, the provincial government was interested in provincial level uh, accounts of ecological footprint and biocapacity um, because as you can appreciate, just like in America, there's a lot of diversity across the country with regards to how things are produced, including how electricity is generated, for example, that has different emissions coefficients, et cetera. And there's also different policies at the level of the state or the province um, as well. There's federal ones, but there's also provincial ones. So we've generated accounts at a provincial um, level that has been very uh, informative to the province as it tries to figure out ways to report on human impacts on biodiversity. And also as the Ministry of Natural Resources and some other departments um, try to better understand the values provided in conservation as, com as compared to the values of, um, of um, harvests and consumption of resources, forest resources and so on. Uh, and then one of the things that's happened since then is that there's a lot of organizations who are interested in even downscaling the data down to the level of a, of a municipality or a rural area to better understand the natural assets within that part of the province um, and the ways in which the, the town or the county can do things to optimize that value at the same time of also enhancing the well-being of the people who live there. And so that's kind of exciting for us because we're we're getting into um, we're getting much more into now data that's much more specific to a certain part of geography, um, and we've even gone into the realm of generating uh, calculators so that people individually or people as households can answer some questions to help um, them understand the ecological footprint related to things that they either do or do not have control over. And what there, what there are, you know, what are some ways of affecting that uh, in the future? Whether that's something of their own doing, or whether it's um, something of society's doing, so they have to join some campaigns to push for, let's say, changes in everything to do with uh, transportation, utilities, other sort of shared uh, services, uh, and so on. So that's kind of some some interesting um, activities going on uh, there. So. If any of you are interested in some sort of more local initiatives that maybe would, uh, you know, could benefit from any of this information, it'd be really awesome to explore those possibilities as well in uh, in your state or or anywhere else uh, across America. Great. Yeah. Go ahead. 
How do you think the realized and possible technical, technological innovations such as carbon sequestration and nuclear fusion might influence the future of ecological economics? Yeah, well, um, a, a few thoughts on that. So one is that um, in ecological economics, we're kind of interested slightly in the reverse direction of causality, which is like, how can we make it so that carbon sequestration, fusion, and so on, the, the technologies that you spoke about, how can we make it so that those technologies, um, that there's going to be greater adoption of those kind of technologies? How can we accelerate the innovations in those realms compared to the baseline? And a really important way to accelerate the innovation of a lot of technologies to reduce the total amount of carbon emissions, and then on an interim basis, even reduce the amount of emissions per unit of output, is through either carbon capping or carbon pricing. And the two of them are somewhat related. And so people will talk generally about carbon pricing, which is either directly saying for each unit of carbon that's emitted, here's a price that's to be paid. And you can make it so that the price that's paid relates to, for example, the social cost of carbon or the amount of damages inflicted upon all of humanity from each additional unit of emissions. So that's one way to do it. The other way to do it is through a, a cap and trade program, kind of like what has been done in America uh, historically on uh, emissions of sulfur dioxide um, to cap the total amount of emissions and then allow the emitters to figure out amongst themselves um, the distribution of those reductions over time through a system that uh, requires people to hold a, uh, a sort of a share of the total cap. And if you reduce the total cap over time, that's the way that you can reduce uh, total emissions. And then that effectively prices carbon, but it's an indirect way because you're setting the quantity to affect the price rather than the other way around, which is you're setting a price to affect the quantity of emissions. So that's the thing that I think excites um, a lot of ecological economists, not only in Canada, but around the world. Uh, and what's interesting is that now about a quarter of all the emissions across the planet in this year will be subject to some kind of a carbon pricing system, whether that's the explicit price-based approach or the quantity-based approach of emissions trading kind of system. It's taken a while to get up to a quarter, um, but it's really ramped up in the last five years or so. Now, there's still a lot more of emissions that aren't captured yet, uh, but things are in the works. Um, but I think it's when more and more of emissions are within some kind of a pricing system, that's when you'll have much more a greater acceleration on all those technologies. Great. So I have a question. Um, I'm not in the camera, but you can hear me. Um, so I'm curious, uh, we, we sort of got a quick look at some of the suggested uh, solutions from the Global Footprint Network. Um, did you have any personal uh, favorites, any particular solutions that um, you uh, think are really promising uh, for reducing our, our global um, ecological footprint? Uh, well, there's a lot of exciting solutions. I guess it depends on um, the circumstances of, of the person, the household, and where they are uh, in, in the world. Um, one thing certainly in uh, in Canada is that we, because it's a very cold country, more or less, I mean, um, that uh, a lot of emissions and a lot of ecological footprint relate to the space that we occupy for, you know, the space that we live in, the space that we work in, the space that we learn in in our universities and so on. Uh, and there's tremendous ways to reduce the ecological footprint associated with the living space, the working space, and the studying space. Um, so many to uh, to speak about. Part of it relates to the fuels that are used to heat and cool those areas. Uh, part of it relates to even um, the efficiency by which we use space. Uh, in my own university, for example, the efficiency by which we use classrooms, office space, and so on. Um, and I've done some uh, some detailed work I didn't show here, but um, in my home university, York University, I've assessed the uh, the emissions related to its scope one, two, and three um, consumption. 
Uh, that includes the you know use of space. It also includes commuting to the campus and so on. Um, and then we've also generated ecological footprint results uh, related to those emissions as well. Um, and there's some, um, I think in that realm, there's a lot of what I would call low hanging fruit of things that can be done somewhat readily without anything too you know, dramatic in the form of a change uh, to yield great emissions payoffs, to yield great reductions in ecological footprint, again, associated with how we use uh, space and also how the fuels and so on that are used uh, in that, um, you know, the energy for eating and cooling out of the space. Uh, secondly, of course, in transportation, there's a huge amount of uh, potential there. I'm sure many of you are aware of just the the potential and what savings you can get. Um, but it's really interesting at this point too, now that we've experienced a, a lot more use of virtual um, platforms, such as the one that we're engaging on now versus in person and so on, um, there's, yeah, there's, it's been really exciting at the university level to look at what the potential is for uh, further changes in that optimizations of um, when classes are are uh, arranged and the sort of in-person versus remote and the blending of those two possibilities alternating one versus another and so on without um, you know without undercutting the, the the quality of the outcome the well-being the learning outcomes and all that sort of stuff well, I think we've gotten a snapshot from the, the global to the hyper-local. We can think about uh, our campus as well in the same um, light. I, we have come to the end, so I'd like to thank you, um, our presenter, Eric Miller, again, um, from York University, very much uh, for your presentation. Thanks so much to all of you for joining us tonight, and please come back again next week. Bye.